Monsanto. For 20 years I've traveled the globe, and everywhere I've heard about this American multinational. But what I've heard hasn't always been positive. Wanting to know more, I surfed the web for months to put the pieces of the puzzle together. On its website, Monsanto positions itself as an agricultural company that aims to help farmers produce healthier food while reducing agriculture's impact on our environment. Its leading product is Roundup, the world's best-selling herbicide for the last 30 years. One shot. All it takes for weeds. Roundup. Monsanto is also the world leader in biotechnology. 90% of the GMOs grown on the planet belong to them. Most of them have been genetically modified to resist the application of Roundup, like Roundup-ready soybeans. Monsanto's GMOs have invaded the planet, but no ag industry product in history has ever incited as much controversy and passion. Why? What's at stake with GMOs? And could the company's past shed some light on what the company is or claims to be today? Founded in St. Louis, Missouri in 1901, it was not always an agricultural company. It was one of the largest chemical companies of the 20th century. Chemistry is working for you. And very likely Monsanto is working for you. Monsanto, where creative chemistry works wonders for you. The wonders boasted about in this commercial made Monsanto one of the most controversial companies in the industrial era. Agent Orange, Aspartame, Bovine Growth Hormone, PCBs. These chemically created oils used worldwide as coolants and lubricants in electrical equipment were the jewels in Monsanto's crown for over 50 years until they were banned in the early 1980s. A Washington Post article from 2002. Monsanto hid decades of pollution. It happened in Anniston, Alabama. Monsanto got permission to bury PCBs in Anniston. And uh, this is Snow Creek right here, where they put the cement in here. It comes from the plant discharging the PCBs all the way down through here. And it was poisoning. They never told anybody, but they told the state. The state didn't tell us. PCB Monsanto knew. But what exactly did they know? An environmental organization in Washington, D.C., headed by Ken Cook, has put internal Monsanto files online. Most of them are classified confidential. FYI and destroy. Pollution, a letter addressed to sales executives in 1970. This is the one that really tells you the story. They're saying, we can't afford to lose one dollar of business. Their neighbors in Anniston were not told about the, the poisoning that they were inflicting upon them because they didn't want to lose one dollar. It was only when lawyers went to court on behalf of people in Anniston and forced the company through the legal system to disclose these internal secret documents that we knew what they knew. They knew the truth from the very beginning. They lied about it. They hid the truth from their neighbors. They hid the truth in many cases from the government authorities. And when they did share information fr with government authorities that should have been acted upon, the government of authorities, instead of siding with the people who were being poisoned, sided with the company. They sided with Monsanto. It was outrageous, absolutely unforgivable. 
David Carpenter is one of the most qualified specialists in the field. He carried out the testing for the Aniston residents. We all have PCBs in our bodies. The polar bears and the penguins have PCBs. And what has happened is in the past, there were a few sites where PCBs were released. But over time, they've gone into the air, they've gone into the water, they've transported, so the whole world is now contaminated with PCBs. The issue is that many diseases are caused by PCB exposure. The one everyone knows about is cancer. In 2001, 20,000 Aniston residents filed two lawsuits against Monsanto. Monsanto and its subsidiary, Solucia, settled by paying $700 million to compensate the victims, to clean up the site, and to build a specialized hospital. But no Monsanto executive was ever sued. To do justice. Under American law, in most instances, it's very rare for executives or uh, officials in these companies to be held criminally responsible. So we have the civil system, the civil courts. We make them pay. And the truth of the matter is, in most instances, uh, the price these companies pay decades later is a fraction of their profits. And this is why it pays to keep these problems secret. And it makes you wonder what they might be keeping secret now. Uh, I have to say, we would never trust a company like Monsanto to tell the truth about a pollution problem or about a product. We would never trust them. Title, Foods Derived from New Plant Varieties. Date, May 29, 1992. Principle 1. Foods derived from genetic modification are regulated within the existing framework that applied to foods developed by traditional plant breeding. Obviously, the FDA decided not to create a special category for GMOs. For further information, contact James Mariansky, who headed the biotechnology department at the time. I remember meetings that we had where the Monsanto scientists uh, met with the FDA scientists and they went through the kinds of modifications that they were making and how those were being done and Basically, what they were also saying to FDA is, how will these products be regulated? I have never seen a situation where one company could have so much overwhelming influence at the highest levels of regulatory decision-making as the example of Monsanto with its GM food policy in the government. Exceptional news footage actually shows George Bush Sr. visiting Monsanto's research facility nine years before Roundup Ready soybeans were first sold. When George Bush Sr. toured the company's headquarters, he was Ronald Reagan's vice president, and deregulation was this Republican administration's watchword. The intention was to boost industry by eliminating what White House hardliners called bureaucratic hurdles, like health and environmental safety testing, which were Monsanto's key problems. And we have before USDA right now a, a request to test this for the first time in a, on a farm in, uh, in Illinois this year. And, uh, Get hallucinating about it, we'll lose another year. Yes, yeah. 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 And then uh, the expense goes out and nothing happens because you can't. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say, quite frankly, we have no complaint about the way USDA is handling it. Uh, they're going through an orderly process. They're making sure Very that thorough. as they deal with these new things, they do them properly. And uh, now, if we're waiting until September and we don't have our authorization, we may say something different. <laughs> Call me. We're in a direct business. <laughs> In 1988, when George Bush Sr. was elected President of the United States, Dan Quayle became the new Vice President. Four years later, he announced the American policy concerning GMOs, drafted just as Monsanto had wanted. We are taking this step as part of the President's Regulatory Relief Initiative, now in its second phase. The United States is already the world leader in biotechnology and we want to keep it that way. In 1991 alone, it was a $4 billion industry. It should reach at least $50 billion by the year 2000, as long as we resist the spread of unnecessary regulation. From a corporate standpoint, it was a brilliantly executed takeover. Early on, uh, 
a gentleman by the name of Michael Taylor became the deputy uh, administrator of the Food and Drug Administration right at the time that they were about to set out their policy. Who is Michael Taylor? On the internet, only a single image remains of the man who once wielded his power so discreetly. Today he has a foundation called Resources for the Future. He moved over to the FDA in July of 1991. Up until that time, he was at a law firm called King & Spaulding. His personal clients included not only Monsanto, but the International Food Biotechnology Council. And he had drafted for them a proposal for how they would like to see genetically engineered foods regulated. And if you look at the proposal that was written for IFBC that was Michael Taylor's with the final one that was published, it looks very, very similar. So if he didn't write it, it looks like somebody took what he wrote and changed it slightly for the policy. Mr. Taylor was the um, uh, deputy commissioner at the time and he provided the leadership um, for the project and served as the, the chief, uh, the sort of the lead uh, policy person in terms of uh, making sure that the project got done. So Monsanto played that game very well, both the political game and the uh, regulatory game. They played a key role in bovine growth hormone in getting that thing approved and also in how genetic engineering was dealt with. Michael Hansen has just mentioned bovine growth hormone. Monsanto began selling it to dairy farmers in 1994 under the brand name Posilac. Ozilac is the single most tested new product in history. You'll soon see the dramatic results Pazilac can offer you. In 1985, Monsanto submitted Pazilac to the FDA for market approval. The experts at the FDA's Center for Veterinary Medicine reviewed the studies that the company had carried out on experimental herds. At the FDA, the veterinarian in charge of reviewing the data was Richard Burroughs. In an interview, he stated that agency officials had suppressed and manipulated data. The data that they came in with lacked a lot of insight into the dairy industry. They didn't ask crucial questions about these diseases, and that is mastitis, which is infection of the mammary gland, and reproductive problems. So when the first data came in and that was missing, I said, um, all right, guys, you need to go back and get information. So that set it back probably two or three years. Did you warn the FDA about your concerns? They pretty much just sidetracked me. They pulled in, my boss pulled in other people that were closer to him, and I saw less and less of the data. Even the things I had asked for to be done, I didn't like the mastitis studies. I never really got to see a lot of that because they figured, well, if you're in the way, we'll get you out of the way. So they sidetracked me. Eventually I was fired. One day I was escorted to the door and told that was it. I was, I was done. Have you been threatened? Yes, um, mainly by the lawyers for Monsanto because when I was going for my appeal, they told my lawyer that if I went in and revealed any company secrets in my defense, that they would sue me. In the end, the FDA was forced to reinstate this conscientious veterinarian. He eventually resigned, disheartened. On the internet, there's also talk about files that were stolen from the FDA and sent to Dr. Samuel Epstein, who heads the Cancer Prevention Coalition. In 1990, Samuel Epstein published an article in The Milkweed, the standard for dairy reporting, edited by Pete Hardin. The scoop was based on the secret documents that the two men scrutinized. One morning, uh, I came in, I think in October of that year, I came into my office and found a great big box of documents. And um, the, it came from Washington, but no indication as to who sent it. 
This was a box of files of all Monsanto records which had been submitted to the FDA on the veterinary tests in the preceding six years or so. Many of these documents are original documents, uh, and as it says here, company confidential. It can, contains confidential information which not be, may not be reproduced, revealed to unauthorized persons, or sent outside the company without proper authorization. As an investigative journalist, that's the kind of stuff I like to report. Revealing this information made Monsanto and FDA very, very angry because what we were able to establish is that there were dramatic physiological changes in the animals that received the shot, the hormone shots, compared to their control group peers. For example, we see the ovaries of the cows receiving the synthetic hormone in the different treatment groups were, for the right ovaries, 34% larger, 42% larger, and 44% larger. Elsewhere in the stolen files, it shows how there were severe problems with the reproduction of these treated animals. The data is conclusive. We provided the data, the raw data, uh, and summary data, peer-reviewed data not done by us, to support the submission. Every health authority who has looked at bovine somatotropin has found that it is completely safe for consumers. For Monsanto, the hormone is not only safe, it is actually beneficial for consumers. Because the chemical composition of the milk is not altered as a result of Pozolac, the manufacturing and taste properties do not change. It's untrue or lie, whatever adjective you want to use. <laughs> um, it's a very different product. It's a very, very different product in many, many ways. First of all, um, as there's a high incidence of mastitis in the cows, there'll be pus in the milk. And then you'd find antibiotics to the, uh, given to the cows to uh, treat the mastitis. So a wide range of antibiotics would be in the milk. Apart from that, and very, very importantly, very substantial increases in levels of IGF-1 or insulinite growth factor 1. There have been a series of studies somewhere in the region of 60 relating increased levels of IGF-1 and breast, colon and prostate cancers. Absolutely incredible. Are there other countries that have approved RBGH? Apparently, the hormone was banned in Europe and Canada. Canada? That's strange because Health Canada usually models its decisions on the FDAs. RBGH, scandal at Health Canada. Monsanto accused of attempt to bribe Health Canada for RBGH. Margaret Hayden, I swear that the evidence I shall give in October 1998, three scientists from Health Canada testified before a Senate commission in order to stop the approval of the transgenic hormone. The scandal was made public by whistleblower Dr. Shiv Chopra. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. My question to myself was, what truth am I going to tell the one I know or the what the minister is telling me to tell? And that was my uh, conflict. I would ask each one of you, have everyone, any one of you been uh, lobbied by Monsanto? Any one of you? No. Dr. Hayden? I did attend a meeting uh, back uh, approximately about, I believe, 1989-90, uh, and Monsanto representatives had met with uh, myself and my uh, supervisor, Dr. Drennan, and my director, Dr. Messier, and at that meeting, uh, an offer of one to two million dollars was made uh, by the company and uh, I don't know uh, any more about what became of that but uh, my director <coughs> indicated after the meeting that he was going to report it to his uh, superiors. How did Monsanto react? Well, Monsanto did not deny that they made the offer of one to two million dollars at this meeting. They later on tried to say Oh, this was an offer of research in Canada uh, to 
uh, do some more studies in cows in Canada or whatever. So anyway, that's what happened in Canada. The drug was not approved. So the European Parliament, based on what revelations in Canada, banned it forever. And then all of a sudden, we three, Margaret Hayden, Gerard Lambert, and I were dismissed for disobedience. And we fired. All three of us were fired, and those fights are now in courts. The United States Congress also opened an investigation at the request of RBGH opponents who oppose the ban on labeling milk as RBGH free. Interestingly enough, the investigation was never completed. Purchases of milk surpluses. Bovine growth hormone, BGH, is a test of consumer acceptance of genetic engineering. In the garbage. In the garbage. In the, garbage. In the, garbage. the cow hormone drug was simply the first major application of biotechnology to food production and Monsanto is a very powerful corporation with many, many linkages to top-level persons in government. Uh, I think the prevailing ethic at the federal government was f f biotechnology is so important that we can't let a few little questions about cow safety or human safety get in the way. The reason the FDA approved it is it appeared to be that there was a lot of people that used to work at had key positions that had worked for Monsanto, came over to the FDA and managed to get the FDA to approve it. It's revolving doors that move up. It's kind of like a double helix, a spiral. The revolving door? Yes, revolving door. The revolving door is not just in agriculture. It tends to be in many, many areas. <laughs> Donald Rumsfeld was the CEO of Searle, which was a Monsanto subsidiary. The former U.S. trade ambassador, Mickey Cantor, ended up on Monsanto's board. Supreme Court Judge Clarence Thomas used to work for Monsanto. Monsanto revolving doors. The state of affairs in 1999 includes Linda Fisher moves from the Environmental Protection Agency to Monsanto, Michael Friedman from the FDA to Monsanto, Marsha Hale and Josh King from the White House to Monsanto, Margaret Miller from Monsanto to the FDA, William Ruckelshaus from the EPA to Monsanto, and let's not forget Michael Taylor, who went back and forth several times. I personally have said that Congress should change the law. Congress should create a mandatory notification system that ensures that every product is looked at by FDA and that FDA makes a safety judgment about every product. That's some very compelling testimony. It seems that Michael Taylor has qualms about the policy he signed in 1992. What about the FDA's own scientists? Was there a consensus on the GMO regulations? FDA documents show they ignored GMO safety warnings from their own scientists, written by Steve Drucker. Lawyer Stephen Drucker represents a coalition of nonprofit associations. He sued the FDA, forcing it to declassify its internal files on GMOs. We received over 44,000 pages from the FDA's own files, and they revealed that the FDA has been lying to the world since 1992, if not before. But they continue to lie. They are still lying. They claim that there is an overwhelming consensus in the scientific community that genetically engineered foods are as safe as their conventionally produced counterparts. And they claim that there has been sufficient data to back up this consensus. Both of those claims are blatant lies. There are several examples. For instance, Dr. Louis Preble of the FDA's microbiology group wrote, quote, there is a profound difference between the types of unexpected effects from traditional breeding and genetic engineering, unquote. Then Dr. Preble added in his memo that some of the aspects of genetic engineering may be more hazardous. The concern expressed by the FDA's various scientific experts was so clear and unmistakable 
that the FDA official whose job it was to track and summarize the scientist's input, Dr. Linda Call, wrote a memo to the FDA biotechnology coordinator, Dr. James Mariansky. According to the internal FDA's files, which have been declassified now, uh, there were many in-house critics, I mean, among the scientists of the FDA, uh, about the uh, proposed policy. I have, for instance, a memorandum sent to you by Linda Kahl. Right. She stated, the processes of genetic engineering and traditional breeding are different. Traditional breeding are different, and according to the technical experts in the agency... They lead to different risks. Different risks. The point was that we had many people with many different views. Uh, Linda Call, of course, wrote that in her memo. But in fact, when we finished the policy, all the scientists agreed with the policy. Now, FDA has, of course, looked at the use of genetic engineering and has no information that simply the use of the techniques creates products that differ in safety or quality. Even before the consistent warnings in the memos from the FDA's own scientists, the FDA had very clear warning because the very first genetically engineered food supplement that came to market in the United States caused a major epidemic. Do you remember what happened in 89 with uh, L-tryptophan? Uh, Do you remember? Yes. It was a bioengineered amino acid. We know very well what's amino acid and... Right. That killed dozens of people and made hundreds and hundreds sick. It caused an epidemic of an unusual disease called EMS. Right. And how many, many people died? Right, but we have many... 37, and more than 1,000 people disabled. Do you remember? I do and remember. And you said, according to FDA administrative record, we do not yet know the cause of EMS, nor can we rule out the engineering of the organism. Did you say that, what I read? Yes. <laughs> 